All right, welcome to Managing the Online Teaching work Workload. Um, we are uh, going to be discussing today how to manage our, our teaching workload while we're teaching an online course. Um, I'm your presenter. My name is Amanda Smothers. Um, I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator here in the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. I work, um, or I've been teaching college English for over 11 years now, uh, beginning as a graduate student here at NIU. And I earned my PhD in English at NIU in 2016. I've been here in faculty development for about the past six months since May. Early on, I taught face-to-face -face classes only, but I've been teaching a combination of face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and online courses for about five years. I've taught mostly first-year composition online. That's, you know, probably typical for English. Um, but I've also taught introduction to literature and Shakespeare courses online as well. If you want to share anything about yourself um, in the chat, then please let us know what your department or division is, um, your online teaching experience, so how many years you've been teaching online, how many courses you've taught online. Um, so let us know a little bit about yourself. Um, if you didn't enter your name when you logged in, which it looks like everybody did, make sure to mention who you are as well. So again, you would just click on that chat bubble and then type into the the box where it says say something and then you just press enter when you're ready to submit that so a few people are typing right now Okay, Chris is from CanPE, has zero experience teaching online, great. Samantha as well. Um, Jennifer is from Public Health, she's taught, teaches a few online courses each semester. Um, and Alicia is an instructor in the School of Nursing doesn't teach online, um, but much of the context that you have for your clinical course is online, so you're trying to enhance that. Um, Reza is an assistant professor of marketing, not currently teaching online, but will, um, but has taught online courses at UMass. Julie's in leadership, educational psych, and foundations department in College of Ed, mostly face-to-face, -face, but have taught online um, grad and undergrad courses for seven years. Um, Catherine has, is from Health Sciences, several years of teaching online. Justin, Sociology, no online courses, but taught a summer program for the past seven years. Um, and then Nancy has her hand raised, so if you want to share your audio, you can, or you can... I, I don't think my chat works. You don't think your chat works? Because I, I put it in a chat, but it's, I can't, when I hit enter, nothing happens. Okay, what browser are you using? Google Chrome. Google Chrome. Okay. Um, I will have Dan get a hold of you to to see maybe if if he can troubleshoot that for you. Okay. 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 Okay, so bills and music, you use it as part of teaching, but not all, all online. Um, great. Okay. All right, so Nancy, Dan has given you his phone number there for you to contact him so he can help you with that. Okay, so we will move on then. 
So this is just our introduction to the workshop. We're going to discuss a few aspects of online teaching workload, including course design, course delivery, and grading today. Uh, so whether you've designed the course or are preparing to design the course or the course was designed by somebody else, you'll all be able to take away some useful tips today for how to manage your workload at various steps in the online teaching process. So in this workshop, I will be sharing some practical strategies for how to keep up with your online course, which is always on. Um, and I'll be sharing tips for how to save time in your course design and delivery and for how to increase your efficiency with your online course delivery. So here are the three pillars of managing the online teaching workload that we'll be ta talking about today. Um, the three main sections of today's workshop are tips on course design, course delivery, and grading. We'll discuss each of these topics individually and we'll begin with course design. And uh, Josephine has just chimed in. Um, she teaches microbiology to medical lab science students. And she's taken an online course but on how to teach but hasn't actually done one herself. Great, thank you. And welcome to the workshop, Josephine. All right, course design is what happens before your course goes live to students. This is the legwork that we do to plan and set up our course in the best way possible so that students can find our course content easily and navigate our course easily. There are several ways that we can save ourselves some time during the course design process and we'll discuss those right now. So the first tip I'm going to share is to use existing learning resources. NIU has come a long way with increasing and improving access to affordable course materials for students. Our textbook affordability task force has created a resource for NIU faculty that illustrates the impact of expensive textbooks on students. And this resource includes ways to discover high quality, low cost, or free alternatives to textbooks. And I'll be sharing a link to the library's textbook affordability guide for faculty in the chat thread. Um, and there's also a guide for faculty on how to choose accessible course texts so that all students are able to access your course materials. And I'll share that link with you as well. So let me just share those links for you just quickly here. So that first link is the link to the textbook affordability guide. So you could click on that. Um, and then the second link that is coming up is the accessibility section of that faculty guide there. So you can um, access both of those. Um, so some of the open educational resources, or they're also called OERs, OERs, are linked on the library website. And they include Merlot. Um, open textbook library and OER Commons. There are several other linked options as well. So you can go to that first link there um, and scroll down and you can see all of the resources that they've compiled that you can choose from and explore for your online course. And they also can be used for um, your face-to-face -face courses too. Um, you can also add a course reserve copy of your textbook to the library so that students who can't afford the textbook, if you do want to have a, that physical textbook, can go to the library to complete their assignments. You can either provide a copy of the textbook. For example, you can request a free desk copy um, from the academic publisher. Uh, or you can request that the library purchase the textbook. And they're particularly interested in high-priced textbooks or items that are for high enrollment courses. Another way to manage your workload is to stay organized. This will be especially helpful as you create content and ass assessments for your course before you begin developing your course on Blackboard. So develop an effective system for organizing your course files and make sure that you back up your work, as we tell our students to do, uh, just in case. I save my teaching files in Google Drive, but you can save them wherever is most convenient for you, including your NIU OneDrive account. By organizing your files, you're going to avoid having to search around for the right files when it comes time to add them to your Blackboard course. 
So in these examples that are up on the screen right now, I've created a folder for a course that I'm going to teach. Then I've added folders for each week of that course. You could also use units or modules if you prefer, um, or some other labeling system depending on how you want to set up that course. Within each subfolder, I would save documents like my weekly announcement, readings, which could be either a PDF or a link to the resource, like one of those OER resources, um, or any assignments that you'll create and a document with quiz or test questions questions, which could help you ensure that your tests and quizzes are balanced so you can take a look at them before you build them into your course um, or that they cover sufficient information or you could even use that as a, a backup too. I know I've had a, a faculty member ask you know, how to print off their quiz from online just in case because they do quizzes at the beginning of their course or of their each class session online and the students use laptops. Um, and what happens when a student forgets their laptop um, or their laptop isn't working or they can't connect to the internet on their laptop, then you have maybe some paper copies as a backup there. You'll also want to um, organize your important links. So if you have links to sources, you could create a Word document or a OneNote document with a list of hyperlinks to save and share with your students. You could also use an external site like um, Dingo or Evernote. Um, but you could also, though, create a class notebook in your NIU Office 365 account, which you can then share with your students. You can add them to uh, that class notebook. It's a great way to involve students by having them also share links or resources that they find helpful or useful within the notebook. So you can create also a, um, a collaboration space where you and students can add and edit content and all of the students can view all of that content. You can also create a content library um, in which you as the teacher or instructor can add resources that students can view but they can't edit or add to them. Or a third option is you can create student notebooks, individual notebooks, which are private spaces for each student to add content so that no other student can view it. But you can also add content to that student's individual notebook. So for example, if you think an individual student could benefit from an additional resource, you could add it to her student notebook and nobody else would be able to see that content. Um, so just a visual representation of that. This is what you'll what it'll look like while you're setting up your class notebook and you can see on the left hand side you create a notebook name, you've got a, an overview of, of the different options for that notebook. Um, you can add another teacher, so that would be, you know, if you have a TA that you want to have access as another teacher in that classroom notebook, then that's, you can add that too. You can only add one additional teacher um, at this time. Um, you also then would add student names and design private spaces for those students. So those would be the student notebooks. Um, you preview and then you finish up your class notebook and then it would be ready for you to use. Another strategy for managing your workload is to finalize one module first before moving on to the next module or the next unit or the next week. Uh, by focusing on one module first and then trying to perfect it as much as possible, you can then use that module as a template for the rest of your course modules. The module that you choose to build out first should be one that represents the structure of most of the rest of your course modules. So it may not be a great idea to build module one first, for example, because that might be more of an introduction to the course. It may not follow the structure of organization or organization of subsequent modules. So you want to build out a module that you think will have a good structure that you can base your content rich modules on. Um, so this organizer looks very similar to the folder structure that we just saw for saving your files. Um, so from the left, you might begin with the week or the module that your students will click on to get to your content. And then the next level, the middle, would be the different sections of that module, like the lesson, reading, quiz, discussion board, assignments, et cetera. So that's where you're going to think about how you want each module organized and you want to stay consistent with that organization as you build out your course. And then finally, you're going to include any secondary links to the actual assessments and discussions at that third level. Um, so this three-level organization will work for either course view. Um, be aware that with ultra base navigation um, or, or with ultra course view, uh, you are limited to this this number of levels. So you've got your initial level, then you've got a folder, and then you've got the contents of that folder. Um, you can't build folders within folders within folders in ultra course view. Um, so just as a a general note, ultra course view is not ultra base navigation. The ultra base navigation is what we all see when we log into Blackboard. That's the thing that changed over the summer. Um, ultra course view is an entirely different course setup or design that 
you can see once you click on the individual course. So if you click on your individual course and it looks the same as it always have in previous semesters, then you're in original course view. You can convert to a um, ultra course view. Um, you can preview that um, if you want to see how it looks different and we'll see some examples of what you might see in an ultra course view. But um, just because the base navigation changed doesn't mean that your individual course changed. So you might still have original course view, but um, we all have the ultra base navigation. So when I'm talking about ultra, I'm talking about ultra course view, not the base navigation. Um, so in ultra course view, there can be, as I mentioned, only two levels of folders instead of the infinite levels that you could create in original course view. And the purpose of this, or at least the effect of it, uh, the benefit of it is to make us more aware of how we're organizing our courses and how easy we're making it for students or how hard we're making it for students to find course content. So for an ultra course, we'll want to be intentional about how we organize our content because we cannot just keep nesting folder upon folder upon folder. Um, so you can create a template for your modules that you can use to make sure that you remain consistent in how you set up each module or week of the course. This example template outlines the sections of the course in a consistent order, and then you can fill it in with the detail, details for each module as you're planning your course. So you don't have to show this document to students. This could just be for yourself, or you, you can show it to students as sort of a... Um, a welcome to each module just to give them an overview, um, but it is a great idea to create a consistent template for yourself, um, especially if you're designing a course that others will be teaching, and that'll ensure that those other faculty who teach the course will be able to understand how the course is set up, and they'll have a consistent course structure from which to teach as well. So as you see here in this example on the right, um, it's highlighted where you would remove the highlighting and then fill in the specific information for each module. And then of course you would change the uh, title at the top from welcome to module X to module one, module two, um, and so on and so forth. So I mentioned that there can only be two levels of folders in Ultra. Um, so in Ultra Course View, you would create, you could either create a folder first or you could create a learning module first. And then you can create two levels within that, a folder and the folder contents. Um, so the folder contents would be like links, documents, assessments, et cetera. So here's a screenshot of how week one might be set up in the course for Ultra Course View. Uh, notice too that I've created if you look um, below course, the week one, you see Welcome to English 204. Um, so I've created week one above the welcome section so that students don't have to scroll down to find the most current content. It's right at the top. It's convenient for them to access. So you won't get emails or calls asking you where to find this week's lessons and assignments unless, of course, you forget to make that content available to students. Um, so then you will get emails about that. but. But if you set up, you know, your conditional availability from the very beginning, then that'll be less of a problem. The next way that you can save time is to provide students with specific instructions for what you want them to do. That could be expectations for assignments, such as these instructions for discussions that I did, um, or it could be instructions for how to use specific course tools, such as if you're using the Office 365 class notebook. Um, providing specific instructions is going to help you re reduce student questions and the amount of intervention that you need to do. Um, you can also save yourself time by finding ready-made instructions, particularly for you know course tools or technology. So if it's a course tool on, uh, on Blackboard, a Blackboard tool, then you might be able to go to the Blackboard um, student website with for tutorials or to our website to look at tutorials for students um, and just input those into your course so you don't have to, you know, start from scratch. Um, we also have a link, a license for uh, at NIU for LinkedIn Learning. And through that, you can find instructions and tutorials that you can post in your online class to save even more time when designing your course. Um, so if there are instructions or there's things out there, resources out there for you um, to not have to reinvent the wheel, then please use them because that's going to just save you that much more time as you're developing your course. 
Also, when you are teaching your online course again, so you've already taught it for the first time and you're teaching the same course again in another semester, you can make the process quicker, um, the process of moving that course over quicker by batch editing your course content in Ultra Course View. That'll help you update your availability and due dates for all of your courses that you're teaching online. You can change your dates by either a certain number of days or by entering your current or previous start date and then the new semester start date, which will automatically update course dates by that uh, number of days. You'll still need to go in and check the dates and make some adjustments based on breaks. So for example, if you're moving from the fall semester into the spring semester, you'll have to adjust for Thanksgiving break versus spring break. But the batch edit feature will help you get your dates at least in the correct vicinity for the new semester of teaching. Um, and you can also use batch edit to update availability by making certain content items hidden from or visible to students in this ultra course view. Um, in the original course view, you would use the date management course tool to adjust course content dates by a certain number of days or by using the start date to adjust all the course dates relative to the new start date. <clears throat> so now I'm just going to take a, a minute. Um, I'll pause briefly just in case anyone else has something to share. And please feel free to continue sharing if we move on. I will keep moving on in the interest of time in just a few seconds, but I will address your comments as I, as I do see them. So if you do have something to share about um, any tips that you have um, when you're getting ready with your course, um, then please do share them in the, the comment section. So this is when you're designing a course, what has worked for you um, or what hasn't worked for you. So I see maybe one or two people might be typing. Okay, so I'm going to move on now. Oh, okay, so Alicia says that she's found that it's a delicate balance between providing information and overloading with too much information. That's a good point. Um, so something that um, I do with students, um, you know, I have the welcome section at the beginning of the course, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. You'll kind of see that coming up. Um, but I also hide all of the um, modules that are coming up so that they can only see what's current uh, because then they don't get uh, overwhelmed with everything that they have to do for the entire semester and they can kind of focus on the individual module at hand. So that's one way that I kind of try to provide that balance of providing information and then the information overload. Um, okay, so keep sharing and I will uh, chime in with those those comments as we come along but I'm going to move on to course delivery and so when we're delivering the course that is when we're actually teaching the course and it's live we want to make sure that we provide students with as Alicia said enough information that they can get started in the course successfully without being bogged down with a lot of student questions for you about how to navigate the course but it is that that balance as you said Alicia um, so we want to provide students with welcome instructions or a getting started section that should be readily visible in the course when they first log in at the beginning of the semester. In the original course view, you could change your course landing page to a welcome page or the announcement page if that's where you're getting started information is located on the announcements. Um, but for ultra course view, you can't really change landing page. So you'll want a dedicated section that provides that welcome information and you can kind of see the welcome instructions here and you can see on the left hand side of the screen 
um, where that is located in the course. So this is what students will see when they first log into the course. Um, in this welcome information, you want to provide enough detail that the students know exactly how to navigate the course and what to expect. Um, so I kind of put in bold all of the sections of the course and, and you know, all of the important information, my welcome instructions, and that way they can always come back to this if they need to. And if you need to, um, if you're in original course view, you can always change the landing page too, so you can have the landing page uh, be on the welcome instructions or the welcome section or getting started section or whatever you want to call it first. And then once you get into the course, you can have you can change it to the announcements page if you want to, if you want them to see more recent announcements and they're kind of settled with with those welcome instructions. Um, but they can always get back to them through the left hand navigation. Um, so Kristen said she's tried to do weekly assignments, but many online students don't like it. They want to have flexible due dates. Um, so that's something that I warn students about at the beginning of the semester for my courses. Um, you know, we do have weekly discussion assignments and they're due the same day every week. Um, and the responses are due the same day every week. Um, you know, it's it just depends on the course, I think. Um, sometimes you can't have flexible due dates. So if I'm teaching composition and peer interaction is important. You know, I need to make sure that I have that structured within, um, you know, and for grading sake as well. Um, so one way that you might be able to do flexible due dates is to use modules instead of individual weeks. So I've seen that done as well, where you have, you know, a module that might last a couple of weeks, and then you have um, some some due dates in there. But you also need to, to be aware of you know, what you're teaching, whether flexible due dates might work for you, um, but that might also increase your workload because you're having things coming in at, at different times. Another recommendation that I do have for helping manage your workload is to create a Q&A forum that all students can see, so a discussion forum. Um, then you can answer questions in that forum and all students can see the answer, so you hopefully won't get duplicate questions in your email, for example. Um, I also provide a small amount of extra credit for students who answer the questions correctly before I get to it, and that incentivizes students to check the Q&A board so that they see their peers' questions and to look for the answer to the question, which also helps me manage my workload by having some extra sets of eyes to help with those general queries. Um, you should also provide students with information about a time frame in which they can expect responses from you. Um, that's from email responses to even the Q&A forum. And that hopefully will help students manage their expectations and not hound you with follow-up emails when you don't answer immediately. That doesn't always work. Sometimes students, um, do still hound you if you know they want that answer immediately, um, but it does cut down on that a lot. So whatever your policy is for handling student emails and form questions, just be clear about when you're going to get back to them and try to stick to that. Um, you might also want to outline for students how they should be emailing you. Um, so you might need to clue them in on netiquette. Do you want them to include certain information in the subject line? Um, how should they format the greeting or how should they address you in the email? What are your expect expectations for content? How should they sign their email? Um, that'll help you quickly identify who the student is, who's asking the question, which class section they're in, and what the answer to their question is based on that information. So you're not searching around trying to figure out who the student is or what class they're in. So if you can easily identify them, you know, they're in English 204, um, this is their name, this is the section number that they're in. Okay, I know, you know, they're asking a question about their grade, I can go immediately to that student without having to look up their ZID and trying to figure out, you know, who this is in my five classes or my three classes of, you know, however many students, depending on your subject matter. <clears throat> and Julie says that she's had some great uh, PD from Dan last summer and found Blackboard Collaborate to be one of her new favorite tools. Um, and that's a great way to um, have some synchronous sessions with your online students as well. Um, in the original course view, you can actually subscribe to a forum, which means that you're going to get notifications when someone posts that forum or responds to a classmate's post. And that'll help you keep track of whether, how often, and when students are participating in that Q&A discussion so that you can get into the forum to either answer those questions or to provide extra credit to students who answer each other's questions. Um, but another option um, is 
um, for Ultra Course View. So Ultra Course View, there is actually no option to subscribe to Discussion Forum, but you can set up notifications in the activity stream, and that works for Ultra and Original View courses so that you can get alert when there's activity in your discussion forums. You can't pick out, unfortunately, individual forums to get notifications for, so you'll receive notifications um, for all discussions, so new discussion messages, um, um, uh, through all of your discussions across all of your courses. Um, and you can get those notifications via either email or push notifications. One other way to help save time for yourself and avoid having to answer questions that students could find the information for in the syllabus is to give uh, students a syllabus quiz or test. I do assign a syllabus test at the beginning of the semester and I've done points for the syllabus test in the past, but now I want students to, to actually go through some, sometimes they're just um, content with, you know, trying to guess on the questions and then you know they see that it's not worth that many points and they don't really take it that seriously so what i do now is i require students to get 100 percent to move on in the course um, and access the next module or the next new task so i make clear to students that they can and should look up the answers to the test in the syllabus so i say print out that syllabus or have it open in a new in another um, window and look up the answers to each one of these. I want you to get 100%. And the purpose of the syllabus test is not to memorize the syllabus. For me, for my students, it's to make sure that they've navigated the syllabus at least once and know where to find that important information if they do have questions later in the semester. And I usually pick syllabus test questions that are common questions that I've been asked in the past. So when the drop date is, um, when uh, or what, what the late work policy is. Um, so things that would seem to be questions that you, you get from students regularly that are in the syllabus and you're you know, tearing your hair out, um, then I put those in the syllabus test so that they've all looked up that, that important information at least once within the syllabus and they know where to find it. And then if I do end up getting a question later on, which doesn't happen as much anymore, um, but if I do get a question from a student that is answered in the syllabus, then I can just toss it back to them and tell them, well, the information's in the syllabus, so you can go and find it there. Another strategy that I use is to order my module folders in reverse. That limits scrolling and prevents students from having to search around for the current course content. So having the oldest content at the bottom and the newest on top also helps me with limiting my scrolling as the course moves on, although I do have to scroll past the hidden learning modules at the top at the beginning of the semester um, when I set up my whole course before the semester begins, which I tend to do because then that, that also lessens my workload. So if I'm getting into the semester and I'm grading and having to set up each new module or each new week, every week, then that gets very stressful. So I try to set up my entire course before the semester begins. And I set the dates for you know individual weeks to open, um, for assignments to open. And that way, um, that happens automatically. All of that work is front loaded. And then I can just focus on, you know, communicating with my students, participating, you know, chiming in on the discussion boards, um, giving them some meaningful feedback, and that gives me more time during the semester in order to do those things. Um, but regardless of how you build out your course, you can always drag your folders into this order, so you don't have to be thinking about this when you're necessarily designing your course. Um, but, you know, when you're done developing all of your modules or all of your weeks, you can drag your folders into this order um, so you don't have to think think about it until you've finished building your course. But it is uh, good for saving time for students too um, and saving you some headaches with students asking you, emailing you to ask you where the current week's content is. Another big time saver in helping you manage your workload is to use due dates in the calendar on Blackboard. Um, so what you hear, see here is the Blackboard calendar in the Ultra Course view which doesn't look too much different, it's a calendar, um, than the original course view. So you can see the due dates as you've added them in your course, um, and you can see how the due dates are gonna affect your workload and how you can establish a routine for your course. You can also view the calendar for an individual day. So if you click on an assignment in the monthly view, it, it'll take you to that date and you can see more details about when the assignment is due on that day. I always have assignments for my online courses due at 11.59 p.m. on the due date rather than at midnight the next day because students 
in, my, in the past students have gotten confused about midnight, <laughs> about when an assignment's due, if it's due then. Um, so that eliminated that problem for me and I no longer get students emailing me saying, oh, well, I thought it was due Monday night instead of Monday morning and now they're pretty clear about when things are due. Um, um, I don't, okay, so Kristen said that she's been told by FactDev not to use Ultra because it has too many problems. Um, I don't know who told, I'm not sure who told you that. Um, it has some limitations, some issues, but they're building it out. Um, I don't know what the problems are that you are talking about, but if you can give me more information, I can maybe give you information about that. Um, we are kind of going and with faculty development gung-ho with Ultra, so all of our Blackboard workshops are going to be Ultra-based workshops. We do have original um, workshop um, videos of, of previous workshops available on our website, um, but uh, so you're typing. So yeah, if you give me some more information about that, I might be able to, to update that on you, but um, I wouldn't shy away from ultra um, there are some some considerations uh, when you're choosing whether to go into ultra um, from original course view um, but that will be on an individual basis that you'll have to kind of consider that um, last spring we didn't have um, ultra um, yet um, so we just we just kind of went through it the the transition over the summer um yeah it'll be difficult okay so it'll be difficult um it'll take some time to switch over to traditional so a, a, a straight course conversion um isn't going to make it look perfect or pretty um you're still going to have to do some work so that might be the consideration also if you use um uh, publisher content, not all of the publishers have made their content um, switch over to Ultra and be, be available in Ultra too. So there are different considerations and depending on your individual courses, um, you know, that would be something that we would want to maybe talk to you about again. So if you want to make a, an appointment with one of us, then we can definitely decide if, you know, there are enough updates and changes to Ultra course view. Um, I mean, they're doing it right now, so some of their courses are going to be in Ultra right now, and some of them are going to be in Original. Um, so uh, it's really up to the instructor for which platform they choose. Okay. Um, so you can also view all of your due dates in Ultra Course View by clicking on the due dates filter at the top of the calendar, and that's going to show you a list of the due dates for the entire mon month, which will help you and students what you have due so that you can plan ahead, and that's really helpful with grading, and that's helpful for before you've made your course live so that you can take a look at what all the due dates are and make sure that you don't have, you know, due dates that are maybe too close to each other. For example, an essay due one week and another essay due the next. Um, so take a, take a look at that before you make your course live, just to make sure that also that you're consistent with all of your course due dates. Um, so the best way to use the calendar is to plan out your routine and make it consistent so that your workload is predictable and you can stick to a schedule. So for instance, it might um, I might schedule my weekly announcement to go out every Monday at a certain time, and you can actually schedule that ahead of time, or you can log in to post manually each week, especially if you want to personalize that. You know, you noticed um, not everybody was participating in the discussion the previous week, so you want to you know throw that announcement out there, remind them um, of the requirements for the course. And then I might schedule every Tuesday and Wednesday as grading days for the previous week's assignments so I can make sure I keep up with my grading, get students feedback each week before they have to submit the next week's work, which will help them adjust for your expectations and improve their work over time. And then when I'm finished grading, I would plan on sending an announcement out, letting students know that grading is completed and instructing them to view their feedback before they submit their week's work. And then finally, I might post a reminder about due dates on Thursday to let students know that they have assignments due coming up. I usually have initial discussion posts due on Thursdays and then peer responses due on Sundays, for example. Um, and I also open up my course 48 hours before the week begins. So each new week, I open up 48 hours before that week begins. I start each course week on a Monday and end it on a Sunday. And in that way, by opening it up before that week begins, students can preview the next week's work and get a head start over the weekend too. Um, so that helps if you know students are taking an online course, for example, because they work during the week. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, Josephine, you're asking if a student's voice can be heard if she has a comment or question during Blackboard Ultra class. Um, yes, if she clicks the to share audio, um, so she'll want to um, that student will want to check that their audio is working before they enter the Blackboard um, Collaborate session. Um, and you know, if their chat isn't working, then you might want to have you know some some troubleshooting. Like I had Dan help out with troubleshooting and. Um, so you might want to have a, a phone number that they can call into uh, to, to get that fixed. And Kristen says that she starts her week on a Tuesday and ends on a Monday to give students a full week weekend to work on the course after doing the readings. And they said that they like that. That's another good, good option. <laughs> Um, so once you have that routine established for when you're going to get things done, you can just keep that routine up over the subsequent, subsequent weeks of the course. You might need to adjust or tweak that schedule if you have a big project due or there's a holiday break, for example. Um, but you should be able to remain pretty consistent if you've built that consistency into your course design for each module. And for original view course, you can find the retention center, which is a useful tool in the evaluation section in your left hand navigation of the original view course. In each section of your course, you can monitor at risk behaviors for students, which is going to save you time because you can go into the retention center to view students with missed deadlines and grade um, or activity alerts so that you can quickly contact those students to try to help them get back on track with the course. For ultra um, course view, you can get alerts um, through the activity stream in the ultra base navigation, um, which everyone has access to. So this works for uh, both original and ultra view courses. You can choose which performance alerts you want to see in the activity stream, as you can see here on your screen. Um, and that includes grade and activity level data, students who are falling behind or absent in the course, or students who are failing the course even. So you can click on whichever options you want to utilize for your activity stream alerts. And the course activity related to grades feature is something that is available in Ultra Course View, but we don't currently have access to it at the moment, and I'm trying to, to get that rectified. So we're working on getting access to this feature. Um, it works similarly to the Retention Center in Original Course View, and this feature will allow the instructor to instructor to view information that was previously available in that retention center. Um, so through the course activity related to grades, you can see how much time students are spending in your online course. You can see your students' grades in one place. You can see how students' grades match up with their course activity level. And you can also take act action to send students appointment requests or messages. And you can download your course activity data as well to create a, sna a snapshot of student activity at that moment in time. Um, and I'll share the link to the Blackboard instructor help page in the chat area if you're interested in learning more about this feature, which we'll hopefully be able to use very soon. So after um, the session is over, then I will share that with you in just a, mission, just a minute. And in original course view, you can also send reminders about individual assignments to students who haven't yet submitted those assignments. That's a great way to remind students about due dates without contacting the entire class, including those who've already submitted and don't need that reminder. Um, this reminder is not available in UltraView courses, but students do receive due date alerts in their activity stream, and they can set up their preferences so that they receive those alerts via email as well. So that might be something you want to um, broach with your students. So what online course delivery recommendations do you have? Let's just take a minute to um, use the chat box to share your experiences and ideas. And I will share that link um, for the course activity related to grades feature as well. So I see some people are typing. OK, Kristen uses groups for students to exchange papers for peer review. And you can use groups in either original or in ultra course view.
All right, and keep sharing. I'm going to move along in the interest of time since we're running short on it. Um, but if you um, share, I will make sure that we get that um, shared to the whole group. Um, so next we're going to talk about how to save time while we're grading. Um, so we discussed discussed establishing a routine, but as it relates to grading, we can discuss some specific strategies for pacing. Not every week is going to be equivalent when you're grading. So for example, when you have a major project due, um, one strategy is to alternate between quote unquote harder and easier grading. So for example, something that will auto grade like a quiz could be alternated with a major project that's going to take more time to grade or you might skip, uh, leave a gap uh, in grading as well. One other way to um, speed up the grading process is to use interactive rubrics with Blackboard. You can use interactive rubrics in both original and ultra course view. Um, they're easy to grade with. They take more time to set up uh, ahead of time, but once you're actually grading, it's a lot quicker um, and the more detail that you put into them, the easier grading will be because the less individual comments you might need to make. Um, so you're going to outline using your your grading rubric, the criteria that you want to grade on, and then what, for example, excellent work would look like, what proficient work would look like, satisfactory, unsatisfactory. Um, with ultra course view, you can only use percentages. Um, you can't use points yet, um, but points might be something that you'll be able to use in the future. But with um, with original course view, you can use points, points range, um, or percentages as well, or just letter grades. Um, so that is also something that you might want to take into consideration. I mean, if you use a point system, then you'll need to convert that into percentages. Um, you might also want to enable grading for discussions. I use a grading rubric for discussions too, and I share that with my students. Um, and uh, I use that rubric to for the initial post. So one of my criteria is initial post, and one of them is peer responses. And then I outline what each level looks like for an initial post and peer responses. Um, and then I assign weights to those categories. So half of their grade is their initial response, for example, and then the other half is their peer response um, participation. Um, another way to speed up the grading process is to use the embedded annotations tools, um, and you can use this in both course views as well. Um, this is an image of, of the original course view. Um, so if you want to add comments at specific points in an essay or uh, um, an assignment, for example, then you can, you can annotate uh, directly on their assignment, and then the students will be able to view that once you've submitted their grade. Um, but be economical with these. So um, I try to limit maybe one or two per page. Um, and you want to keep in mind, you know, how much are students actually going to be reading with these embedded comments? How are you going to ensure that they uh, use those comments? Um, so you might want to build something else into the course about, you know, having them view those assignments, maybe reflect on them. Um, you can also save a list of common feedback phrases and keep adding to it, um, providing specific examples um, or ways to, to improve that are measurable. Um, so this could be something, yes, Kristen says to make sure that students know how to use the embedded comments. Um, they don't know how to click on the icon to see the comment. And that's something that you might be able to, to add one of those Blackboard tutorials or a Blackboard link um, for students so that you don't have to, to walk students through that. You can point them to, OK, go to this, look at the video of how to do this, and then you know follow those directions. Um, so that's one way to, to cut back on your workload with that if you're going to be using that that feature. Um, so the common feedback, you know, you can save that. It can be positive and constructive feedback, both that you save. Um, if you notice that you keep having to give the same feedback um, to a lot of students on an individual assignment, you might want to, you know, do some reflective teaching there and consider whether you're giving them the, the um, enough supports to reach that uh, outcome. So that might be something that, you know, if you do notice that you have to save something over and over again, um, some common feedback that you're giving, you know, how can you address that for, for the whole class if that seems to be a common problem among many members um, of the class. So do you have any grading recommendations as well? So I'm going to pause briefly here. Um, uh, we've got a few minutes left, but I do want you to be able to share any of your comments if you have uh, grading tips for making the grading process run more smoothly and manage your time with grading.
So Kristen, you mentioned before that you use groups for students to exchange papers for peer review. You can use groups. You can also use um, discussion boards too. I do that. I have them post to the discussion board. Their initial post is their draft. And then I pair them up uh, for peer review or I let them choose their peer review partners. They have to post a reply that says, I'm going to peer review this person's paper. Um, so that nobody else chooses that and we don't get double double um, comments for one person and no comments for somebody else. Um, and then also with that, I tell my students, you know, if you don't receive a peer response by the due date, email me and then I can give you some comments, some additional comments as well on your draft to make up for that. And does anybody, anybody have any grading recommendations before we move on to closing? All right, well, if any pop up, I will make sure to include those. Um, so just a, oh, Kristen gives grades to students for the reviews. I do too, and I also use a grading rubric uh, to give grades to students for their peer reviews. So if anybody, if any others pop up, then I will make sure to, to include those. Um, so just as a summary, design and build your course for efficiency. Use existing resources whenever available to lessen your workload. Uh, make sure that you organize your files and finalize one module before beginning the other so that you have a template from which to work. Use a consistent template for your course modules and provide consistency in your due dates as well. Um, provide detailed instructions for students on how to navigate your course, and that should be in your welcome message. Uh, and use date management in original course view or batch edit in ultra when copying courses from one semester to the next so that you can make that process run a little bit smoother with updating due dates and availability. Also, you want to manage your time while teaching by helping students to get started and setting clear expectations for their communication with you. You can use a syllabus quiz to get them familiarized with how to find information on the syllabus. Um, you want to put your folders in reverse order with the newest on top and set the folders to open on specific dates so that that lessens the chance that you might forget to open up a particular module or week um, on time. Use due dates and check the calendar. Establish a consistent routine, create a Q&A discussion forum that will help you um, create a place where students can share questions that other students might have and can be answered all at once, um, or that students can answer each other's questions. You might give them a little bit of uh, extra credit there, a couple points for, for doing that correctly. Um, and that'll be important. I always say you have to answer the question correctly in order to get the extra credit. Um, and use the Retention Center for Original Course View and Activity Stream Alerts. Um, as well to identify any at-risk students. Also, you want to be efficient with your time spent grading, so make sure that you pace yourself with grading, um, plan out your grading, especially if you're teaching different preps um, and you have different course schedules, so it's not all the same course, so they're not going to have the same due dates, and you want to make sure that maybe you don't have a major project in one course due at the same time as an essay in another course. Um, develop effective and descriptive rubrics that'll help cut down on your grading time. Use the interactive rubrics in Blackboard. Once you've assigned a rubric in Blackboard um, using the interactive rubrics, you can just click on boxes and then add comments where necessary um, and then that will be shared with your students and it will automatically calculate their grade. Um, save common feedback that you have on students, positive or, or um, constructive. Enable grading on discussions, um, including discussion responses. You can also enable grading on peer review too. Um, use embedded annotation in Blackboard too and make sure that you have instructions for that for your students. Be economical with your comments and you can try the Blackboard Instructor app as well for grading. Um, for right now, you can only grade original view courses on the Blackboard Instructor apps, but I'm sure that very soon we will have um, grading available for uh, our Ultra course view as well. Here are some resources. Um, so if you uh, are interested in any of these. There's one for time management strategies for online instructors. Um, one, be efficient, not busy, time management strategies for online teaching. 10 tips for more efficient and effective grading and tips for online instructors managing files, feedback, and workload. So again, I'm Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator here in um, Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. Uh, there's my email in case you need to get in contact with me. Um, also be on the lookout for uh, a Qualtrics survey uh, that will ask you to evaluate this workshop today. Uh, you can connect with Faculty Development on Twitter. Uh, we're also on Facebook, um, and we're active on both. 
You can also email just FactDev in general. If you don't want to email me directly, you can email factdev at niu.edu.